guys. Welcome today at a new episode of Out of Bend. My name is Jennifer. My name is Dimple. And we are joined today by a new guest, Nikki. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, remediation ar- uh, activities, about being a security architect. Um, but of course, you can introduce yourself way better than I can. So take the floor. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Hi, I am Nikki Robinson. I am a I joke that I'm a security architect by day and I'm a professor by night. Uh, so I work on remediation, incident response, vulnerability management. And then uh, I am a professor of practice at Capital Technology University. Uh, let's see, I have a DSC in cybersecurity, a PhD in human factors. Uh, so I like to sort of blend technical, practical skills with academic research. Um, let's see. Oh, I have my own podcast, uh, Resilient Cyber Podcast that we do every Friday. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So uh, a lot of interesting things. Um, first of all, let's start with the basics. Like, what is your journey in cybersecurity and how did you get where you are right now? Yes. So it's definitely been one of those, uh, you know how they say a career is not linear. You know, it's not a straight line. It's very up and down. It's been very much like that. Uh, So I actually started out as an administrative assistant Um, while I was getting my undergraduate degree. I was trying to sort of figure out what I wanted to do. I was really interested in psychology, which is how I made the loop back to human factors eventually. Um, But yeah, so I started out as an undergrad at George Mason University in psychology. And uh, I had a few friends on help desk where I was working and got really interested in just troubleshooting. I loved troubleshooting like complex computer problems. And so I talked to my, he was the director of HR uh, at at the time where I was working. And I said, you know, I kind of want to get an IT degree. I kind of want to do psychology. What should I do? And he was like, you're crazy. If you want to go into psychology, get into IT. It's a, it's a massive world. Like there's a ton you can do. And so he really encouraged me to take the IT route. So I was in IT operations for about 10, 11 years uh, before I made the transition into security. I got really interested in vulnerability management, vulnerability chaining specifically, so that led me to the DSC in cybersecurity, got my first job as a security engineer, and here I am, security architect. It's amazing. And I also love like psychology and it's it's something that gets more and more in the spotlight nowadays, but it must have been unique when you started with it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And it's been very um, you know, focusing on human factors because it's really one of the things I love about human factors is that it's this beautiful blend of psychology, engineering, and design. And you can use it in so many ways. And, and I think initially when I started looking into human factors, everybody was talking about security and awareness training. And that's one very small component of what human factors uh, and security engineering is. And so I got really interested in, you know, how can I help, really, how can I help security practitioners? I know how tough our jobs are. So how can I help either create tools or solutions or automation or, you know, how can I help all of the the great you know, security practitioners I work with. Like human is the weakest link when it comes to, you know, securing. You secure all the technical stuff, but like human. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. always good to us. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about in vulnerability management about, you know, the CVE IDs and the specific vulnerabilities. And that's important too. It's important to understand that. But when we sh- we talk about just the sheer volume of vulnerabilities that exist, there's no way we can remediate them all. There's no way we can fix every single thing. And so it comes down to the people that you work with, right? Uh, what's their bandwidth? What's their, what's their skill level? Are they burnt out and frustrated? Can they you know, do all this work? And if not, how can I help them prioritize their work um, and try to make it easier on them instead of saying, hey, here's 3000 vulnerabilities, go ahead and you know, go ahead, take care of those. You've got 10 days. <laughs> so maybe if we take a small step back because we've used the term remediation now, now already a couple of times um, what is it actually um, because it is something that we mention quite often if we for example talk about incident response it is an activity that we usually set in the checkbox and yes we remediated it but what does it actually mean Yes, I I love the term remediation because it is a lot of different things. Uh, it's everything from actually, you know, patching or fixing a vulnerability to implementing secure configuration. It could be identity and access management. How do we implement role-based access controls, RBAC, 
uh, to network engineering. You know, how am I, at, how is my network actually look? Is it secure? So it's really, especially from an architecture angle, it's really the entire environment. So to me, remediation is taking a look at the whole environment and saying, what are my risks? What are my biggest risks? And what do I focus on? Because typically in remediation, you've got short-term goals and you've got long-term goals. And so short-term is how do we recover? How do we bring systems back online? Um, and what do we need to do to do that? And then remediation over time is kind of, okay, here's all the things we need to do. It might be a full re-architecture. Uh, it might just be identity and access management, fixing our access controls uh, or, or something else. And so taking that over time. So it's sort of the the short-term and long-term, the, the nice combination of the two. Yeah. And like, how do you say that would tie to, you know, incident response? Yeah. So I think incident response and remediation really work hand in hand because depending on, you know, the attack vector or, or you know, what actually occurred, right? What was actually exploited? How did an attacker get in or was data exfiltrated? Mm -hmm. All of those pieces are really important for me to figure out what do I need to focus on first? What do I need to do to bring the systems back online? Because I might come into an environment and say, wow, we've got a lot of security issues, right? Like I find, you know, we've got a lot of things we need to do, but that might not be important right at this moment. So what's important at this moment and uh, being part of the incident response process is really important to help prioritize, you know, without that information, it's hard for me to, you know, really focus and figure out what we need to do first. So you mentioned, mentioned short-term goals and long-term goals with regards to remediation. Is it uh, too quick to say that the short-term goals are more incident response focused and the long-term goals are more focused towards inc in increasing your cybersecurity maturity, for example, or do they go hand in hand as incident response? I think there's still some tie in there because it, to me, it's all about prioritization. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Part of, I think, incident response, it, there's sort of the three buckets. There's incident response, which is that immediate something happened. We've got to do something now. It's usually containment, right? Eradication, all of those steps. And then recovery. So what components do we need to put in place? Do I need to bring a system back online? Do I need to implement a firewall? What do I need to do? and then remediation over time. So I really see it as three distinct activities, but they all work together um, to help build security. Um, you're absolutely right, maturity over time. I guess with the experience that you've had so far, um, what kind of issues can you actually get with, with these kind of uh, remediation activities? And what do you see usually go very well or extremely poor? Yeah, it certainly depends on the complexity of the environment. And it, it also depends on, you know, is it an on-premise environment? Is it a cloud environment? Is it multi-cloud? Are they in the process of already, you know, maybe moving off of legacy systems into a new environment? All of that nuance is what makes it really challenging because it's like, I've got to come in and figure out very quickly what systems have to come back online, what state they're in, you know, um, and how mature overall their security program is in general. So trying to figure out, okay, what do we have in place now? What do we need to have in place? And really figuring out what is the roadmap to get there? And and usually that's the most complex part of it is trying to figure out all those pieces because especially as an architect, you have to understand it. Like I'll take a, um, let's take like a complex development environment. Like a, let's take a massive uh, development environment in the cloud they probably have dev, test, maybe UAT and then prod. So they've got all these different environments and each environment probably has its own applications, libraries, tools, um, and they may have different security in place in different environments. And so that I think is the most challenging thing is trying to figure out, all right, what environments need to come on at what time? How are they doing like their flow? How are they coding? What, what tools are they using? Um, and what I find works really well is if, the team already has some security knowledge ahead of time. And if they're, you know, they're, they're very comfortable with it, right? If they're like, oh, okay, yep, we see what happened. We're okay. That usually goes really well. If the team is like, okay, yep, we're, we're going to work together. We'll get this fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's far more challenging if you come into an environment and, you know, uh, the people angle again, right? There's a lot of stress and frustration in those situations. It, it's very stressful on anyone, right? And typically, 
when I get involved, people are already working 24 seven. They've mm -hmm. already been trying to get systems back online. They're responding to an incident. They've probably already gotten yelled at by someone, maybe many someones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of the, the bringing the empathy in and trying to understand what's going on. And I find that works really well coming into a situation and saying, okay, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm here to help you get your systems back online. And that's my number one priority. Just out of curiosity, how do you balance that? Because that basically means that you have to keep the, the human factor in mind. You need to be emotionally intelligent, but at the same time, you're dealing with an incident. It needs to be fixed ASAP because otherwise X, Y, Z might happen. Yes, I think it is. it really is understanding uh, human behavior. Um, for example, if I'm dealing with an incident and I see that someone, you know, yes, we've got to push to get these systems back online, but I can see that they're at their breaking point, you know, either mentally or physically, or they're just exhausted and kind of need a break. That's when I have to pull back yeah. because the last thing I want is to make someone leave right? Like, or quit <laughs> yeah. because those are very high stress situations. And so I think it really is under about taking into account how someone is feeling that day and sort of saying, Hey, do you need a break? Let's go get some coffee. Let's get up. Let's get up from our desks. Let's go get some coffee. Take, take 15, 20 minutes. Um, but I think that's why that prioritization piece is so important because if I walked into a situation and I overwhelmed people with, you know, the 500 things we have to do, I think it's, it's far that's a lot more challenging versus coming mm -hmm. in and saying, let's focus on two things. Let's focus on five things, you know, kind of, kind of figuring it out slowly um, versus like overwhelming people. They can small you, events. <laughs> yes. And how do you prioritize then? And of course that depends, I think, vastly on, on, the, on the type of assets that they have, on the type of environment that they have, the infrastructure that is underlying it at all but there must be some sort of a basic approach that you can take in these kind of situations. Yes. I, um, I typically when I'm doing risk management, so I was a government contractor for many years and I used the NIST RMF, uh, mm -hmm. the risk management framework. And so that for me is like sort of my ground zero basics, right? Is it's like, what controls do we need to have in place? Like the, the, you know, we have to first categorize the systems, right? Are these critical systems? Do they have um, PII on them? Do they have, you know, what, what type of systems am I dealing with? And then I need to figure out what controls make sense. Uh, you know, it's not like NIST RMF, you know, when you have time, it's like NIST RMF condensed. So it's sort of like, <laughs> yes, what, what is my condensed version of NIST RMF? So it's a very, um, uh, yeah, I would say con condensed version of RMF, but that's always where I start, uh, yeah. just because I think the steps make so much sense. Okay. That's and like, how do you do this at a scale? You said, you know, you come and look at multiple systems and decide, you know, which systems to bring online and which systems to remediate, you know, immediately. And if there are hundreds of systems, then, you know, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I would say... I, I use a lot of my experience, right? It, it uh, At some point, I think you have to sort of go on intuition yeah. and it's sort of based on that, you know, okay, I understand how they got in. I understand what systems need to come online first. A lot of it is really working with the team because typically when I come into an incident, I don't under, you know, I don't know their environment. I've got to try to get architecture diagrams or, <laughs> you know, network diagrams and try to figure out what's going on. So for me, it's more about, all right, let me listen to the team. I have to, I have to listen to what they're saying, but I also have to take that, you know, that security mindset and come in and be like, okay, I understand we need to bring these systems online, but you know, you're going to have to have this in place, X, Y, and Z in place before you go on. Um, so for me, it's more about, I, I think, leaning on that technical experience. You know, I was essentially an infrastructure architect for, you know, many years before I got into security. And that experience has really helped me figure out okay, what do we have to have online to even be able to bring these systems online, right? Because sometimes it's not, a, it's not as simple as, oh, okay, I have to bring these servers back online. There might also be like, let's um, in like a hosted environment, a virtual hosted environment, those hosts are going to have to be potentially remediated or uh, looked at before I can even bring those servers back online. And typically what I want to do in an environment too is whatever we bring back online, I want to make sure there's backups. I want to make sure that we've got like a whole rollback plan in case things go really bad. 
that we have the data stored somewhere, that we have system stored backups that we can hopefully bring them back online quickly um, and then be prepared in case they have to go back down again. So it's, uh, yeah, just a, a total balancing act. I can imagine that for some people, you coming in or someone like you coming in can be quite overwhelming because all of a sudden they have to, re they have to think of everything they should have had in place already prior to the incident. Yes. Yeah. I, well, and that's why I think it's having that empathy and coming in and saying like, Hey, I'm not here to judge you or judge the situation. I'm here to try to make things better. So let's work together. We'll make it better. Um, that approach I find is a lot better because, you know, in those high stress situations, um, people can get defensive yeah. and understandably. So, you know, this is their environment and whether it was intentional or unintentional, something happened, you yeah. know, and I take, um, you know, like solar winds, for example, when solar winds happened, they really wasn't anybody's fault, right? They were patching their systems like they were supposed to, and something happened outside of their control. And so, you know, for the most part, people aren't doing things, you know, to, you know, do have poor security practices. Most people are already managing security and operations and engineering and new projects and massive infrastructure uh, by themselves. And so usually they're just overwhelmed. So what complicates remediation, actually? You already, you already mentioned it, it's heavily dependent on the type of architecture, assets, etc. But is there something else that, for example, heavily can complicate a remediation action? Yeah, I think it really depends on, again, it really depends on the environment because um, I, it's, I, it's used a lot in the, in the environment or in the industry, right? People process technology, but it really is, if there is, if there's no harmony between those things, if, you know, the people are trying to build processes uh, that don't align with the security policy, or they don't align with this, or they're trying to meet customer requirements, or they're trying to meet whatever, you know, whatever they're trying to meet, and they don't have the tools to do it. Um, it's just, that's what is the most complicated thing, it, like having to walk in and say, oh, okay, um, you need a vulnerability scanner, or you have to set up your reports or vulnerability scans in this way. Uh, that always complicates things because it takes time away from remediation to implement new tooling, new things uh, that maybe they didn't have before, they didn't have set up properly before. And that takes away from remediation. So I think it just the maturity of their security program definitely can complicate or uh, help things. And like, how do you think, you know, uh, what are the gaps in like current uh, remediation, I would say domain or, you know, industry and how could that be improved and, you know, we could do better at it. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny in the remediation space, even in the vulnerability management space in general, there isn't a ton of really good guidance and literature there really isn't there's i think a lot of um there's there's some uh mm -hmm. but a lot of the stuff we have is outdated or from several years ago and vulnerability management remediation recovery all of those the incident response changes so quickly and you know we're using um you know like infrastructure as code how mm -hmm. do you remediate infrastructure as code i have I, I mean there's probably some guidance out there but i would say there isn't any sort of comprehensive literature that walks you through like a, an updated modern remediation approach. So I think there's definitely some some gaps there, mostly in the uh, in the guidance space. I think that there could be some more, um, you know, like we have NIST RMF. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, we, we don't necessarily have anything like that for uh, recovery and remediation. We have things for incident response, uh, but not for that long term over time sort of strategy. So with regards to that kind of a guidance, would you then, for example, look at a research institute to provide that kind of a guidance or more rather towards the vendors who are responsible for the tools that they provide? So I I think it's a mix of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got great organizations like uh, MITRE um, that they have the attack framework and now they have the defend framework, which I love. One of my other favorite resources. I love it. Um, but yeah, so I think it's both, right? If we have think tanks or we have those institutions like MITRE, uh, Carnegie Mellon has some great resources. Um, so I think it's kind of both because we get these great, um, I love the data breach reports that we get, like Verizon has a great one. Um, there's a bunch of companies, uh, the Poneman Institute, they're another good one. And what I've seen, especially in the industry the last couple of years is these 
think, tax, think tanks, institutions, universities working together with industry. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we keep doing that collaboration, we're going to get a lot, continue to get great information. So I hope it's both. Nice. I like that. I really like that. And I hope that the industry actually moves towards that as well. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So um, the buzzword nowadays is, of course, AI automation. And I've heard you already touch upon it slightly at, at several of the answers that you that you gave. But can you elaborate a little bit more on that? How do you feel that AI and automation would actually be helpful for remediation and not just from a buzzword sales perspective? Yeah, so for me, AI, artificial intelligence, to me, it's more about machine learning mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't, we have some AI, but what I've seen with machine learning models is they're super easy to train, they're easy to use, um, and they can be implemented pretty quickly. Uh, so I, I lean more in the machine learning space where I think that there's, there's a lot of great, um, we already have a lot of great libraries and repos and data sets that we can use um, and leverage in this space. There are plenty of security tools that are moving towards that using some sort of machine learning or some AI capabilities. But to me, a lot of the, from at least from a remediation angle, a lot of the automation that can be done, we can use even without that. So it's as simple as like an Ansible playbook or a PowerShell script. Like there's a lot of automation that we can build in, which is why I always lean for free or something that's already installed. <laughs> Huh. versus implementing, you know, other things. But if, I think that there's certainly going to be more of that, especially as we look at the security tooling and vendor space that we'll probably be seeing more AI ML components being used. I think it's great for vulnerability management because in general, if you're trying to identify and identify, prioritize, and then remediate vulnerabilities, the more context that you can give to the systems that you're actually trying to, you know, look at and fix, uh, the better. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the the one thing I'll say about the buzzword, because uh, yeah, it's to <laughs> me it's more about how do you, how are you actually using it, right? <laughs> you know, it's not this big massive. I think people are like AI, it's like this big thing, and it's like well, yes, but someone has to build those data sets. Someone still has to build something first. And so you have to have great data. And so as long as you have great data, then yeah, absolutely leverage it. And it can help in so many ways. So, uh, so yeah, so I think we're still a couple of years away from using it, I think really in the, the vulnerability management space, but, uh, but it's certainly coming. Nice. And like, how about remediation space? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like we're not quite there yet because yeah. I think mostly because of that nuance, right? If you, if you're in one environment and you're, you know, you're a security engineer and you have maybe one organization that you're managing. Yeah, absolutely. Leverage anything that you can uh, to help you with that. But I think if you're in any sort of really complex environment, or you have like a lot of third-party tools and because machine learning right now um, is focused on, especially in the vulnerability management space, is focused on CVE IDs for specific vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other data out there that is really important for remediation, like the human component or like threat intelligence information, right? So how can you prioritize? And so I think we're still missing that integration from threat intel to incident response. We, there, we have some of it, um, you know, with detection engineering, I think it's a great field um, to, to do that. Uh, but we're well, I think we're still building that up. You know, detection engineering wasn't really a thing until maybe two years ago, like was a real industry, you know, yeah. thing that we talked about. So we've been talking a little bit about the the, the challenges, the, the activities in, in the remediation space, the, the innovations that you've seen so far. Um, what kind of an advice would you give someone who would actually um, want to start within the remediation field? Yeah, I, I would say um, any, any IT experience that you would have, any IT experience, right? Like if you're, uh, if you're interested in remediation, you do have to have some, I would say at least some technical background, whether that's incident response or, you know, in security analysis or IT ops. Um, but if you're interested in getting into remediation, I would say start looking at the MITRE DEFEND framework um, mm -hmm. and how it maps to the MITRE ATT&CK framework too. Like look at both of them because they're, they're both very interesting. 
uh, you really have to have, I think, a um, an interest and in, and in want to help people solve problems and really complex problems. So if you love to be a you know a problem solver, uh, it really is a great field to be in. Um, but, and because you're doing something different all the time, right? Like you're looking at lots of different systems. So I think anyone that's interested in getting started, I would say get some resources on incident response. Mm -hmm. um, there's some good books out there. There's uh, one uh, called Cyber Breach. I think it's Cyber Breach something by Andrew Gorecki um, is a good book. And there's a, there's some, some other good incident response uh, books as well. So we, to get some resources on that. We will link them in the comments. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. And um, and then I would say if you're interested in it, even security architecture, Remediation is a great space to uh, to learn more about architecture. So uh, again, there's some really good security architecture resources. I'll be sure to send them to you uh, so we can link them. But uh, but yeah, so I would say get started with some of those and, um, and and really sort of I guess determine if you know if if remediation would be interesting for you because I think if you if you like problem solving, if you're interested in security, uh, and you like working with people, it's it's a perfect space to be in. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, and speaking of problem solving, um, I guess that's also a really good link maybe to like inventing because I heard that you're also on an inventing journey. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I was, re I mean, I've been interested in inventing for years. I mean, I think since I did the DSC in cybersecurity because I was like, oh, research is really interesting. Ooh, coming up with novel concepts is really fun. Like this is, it's such a creative space to be in. Uh, so, so yeah, so I've, especially the last two and a half years, I've been really focused on uh, patenting and inventing. And uh, it's been so much fun uh, mm -hmm. because it's really just, you get to like dream up anything. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Dimple knows. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's, always a, a a really fun creative endeavor Can you, how do you like come up with ideas and you know uh, what is your approach to problem solving in that case yeah so honestly i take for inventing i take ideas from my everyday life and see if they're applicable to security so like for example if i'm playing with my kids and they have like we're playing some game i'm like ooh could that be an interesting security idea? Like, could how could I implement this into a system? So I'm always thinking about like just how everyday life um, problem solving fits into the security space. It's one of the reasons why I got interested in human factors and how can we bring those that domain into security. So, uh, so yeah. So I would say my inventing or creativity sort of space is just everywhere. Um, any anytime I'm doing something, I'm like, ooh, let, let me see if that works. Um, and then from, from the problem solving perspective, I think I've just, you know, even from being on help desk early days in that troubleshooting mindset, I've just always had that natural curiosity for how can I fix something? So if something is broken or I can't quite figure it out, I do not give up. And <laughs> sometimes it's good. <laughs> sometimes that's really bad, but um, I am incredibly persistent. So I think problem solving is about having some of that, those critical thinking skills and being able to work through things. But sometimes I think it's just as much about persistence and de uh, determination and being really resourceful. So yes. if I can't fix something in one way, it's like, okay, let me see, let me try this other way. Let me try this other thing. And uh, I think it's one of those spaces where red teamers and blue teamers really have that, that connection, which I hope we work together more because it's that same natural curiosity that red teamers have, right? To say, how can I get into a system? Mm -hmm. But then my job on the other side is, how can I make sure they don't get into this system? Don't. What are all the ways that they could potentially get in and how can I stop them? I think that's a very, very, very good conclusion. Um, I do want to ask you, based on the conversation that we've had so far, based on everything that we've discussed, is there anything else that you still want to share with our, uh, with our audience? Uh, yeah, just one thing. I, I wrote a book last year. It's called Mind the Tech Gap. Um, and it's about addressing conflict. So it's sort of that human angle between IT teams and development teams and security. Mm -hmm. um, and just taking that experience with how we work together and different problem sets uh, and hopefully building some of those human factors things into uh, IT and security programs. So uh, anyway, I, 
I wrote it based on my experience. I hope people enjoy it. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's the only other thing I've, I've been sort of working on. We'll link it in the comments also. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having Excel. me. Um, Dimple, anything else that you want to close with? Uh, I think, no, that, that would be it. It was uh, nice talking to you and loved your, you know, pre uh, perspective on remediation uh, and instant response and also inventing. Definitely. And to be honest, I'm actually still quite a little bit curious on that. So we might just, if you're open to that, dedicate an episode on that as well. Oh, that would be amazing. That would be so much fun. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Definitely keep that in mind. And I'm yes. you were. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, that being said, uh, Nikki, thank you so much for joining us today. I think you are able to com to convey such a complicated and complex and broad topic in a very simple manner, which I absolutely love you for. Um, thank you again. And to our audience, if you have any ideas with regards to topics that you wish us to discuss or have guests that you want us to bring on the show, let us know. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Until next time. Ciao, ciao. Bye.